want to comment the duality of the blue light. Uh, the beginning of the spectrum is uh, harmful and the end of the spectrum is uh, <coughs> beneficial. Do, do you want to comment this? Mm, uh, well, uh, the blue light is a spectrum. Uh, we go from very high energy visible, uh, high energy light, which is the ultraviolet, to the violet, which is between uh, 400 and 450. And then you probably have the blue spectrum, which is 450 to 400, and then you have the green spectrum after that. Uh, what is the beginning of the, the, the blue light exactly? Do you, can so you specify this? Because there is a controversy mm -hmm. about the beginning. The, be the beginning is, it, again, it's like trying to say at the beginning, what, what's the difference between fructose, glucose, and, and mannose, and galactose, etc. You really can't. It's a spectrum. They all will do the same thing, just at higher or lower levels. Now, if you catch the wavelengths of light, uh, which are more in the violet range or the violet blue range, that probably has the highest potential damage uh, to our bodies, our eyes, so on and so forth. But if you go to the lower levels, um, that's when you get into the, sort of the beneficial yet potentially harmful side effects. So you have to sort of balance these things off. Um, the problem with blue light is it affects not only our eyesight, but it also affects our uh, circadian rhythm uh, as well as our metabolism. And as a result, we really don't know enough. We have to study more. That's why we're here. We're researchers. We need to find out more the balance between uh, the different spectrums of light. Do you think there's a difference between natural solar light and <coughs> an artificial light that may come from a uh, a bulb or screen or, or whatever, because the, the exposure to screens is quite new, in fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, six, continue. seven years ago, the, the exposure was different because the, 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 the screens were different on the computer, and all those tablets and, and smartphones were not available. Right. So, so there's a big change it, between natural sunlight exposure and artificial light. Does it make a difference to you or to some mm -hmm. others? On your iPad, you have the spectrum of the different light. You, you can see uh, the, the, the sun, the sun uh, light, and you can see the LED uh, exposure too. This is different in the spectrum. Yeah, so for example, here you see this, the peak of blue light with LED uh, is as high as the peak, as the blue light from daylight. Yes. Right. So, so, so is it, is it relevant, something? something uh, absolutely. That, 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 that narrow peak is different from that more broad <coughs> spectrum? So radiation exposure is always timed as uh, power over time. Mm -hmm. Now, daylight, I mean, how many people sit in the outside looking at the blue sky? Probably, I don't know, if you don't have a job, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, but but uh, so our exposure, when we do historical exposures to sunlight, very, very difficult. We were talking about this earlier. Very difficult to measure exactly how much light you're, you're, you're receiving. Mm -hmm. The problem with computer screens and iPads is that they directly go straight to our macula and we stare into them. Now, the power may be a little less, but the time frame is much longer. I have some patients who, well, I have some children who spend probably at least 10 hours in front of these, these things. And so what do you do? <laughs> I tell them to wear protective lenses, but <laughs> you know, uh, or or not do it at all. Perhaps we have to discuss about the, the luminance and the power of the correct. Yes, yes, to better understand the mechanisms. Because but looking yes. at your graphs that you put right here, as as he uh, yeah. pointed out, the, the the peak is about the same as daylight. Yes, exactly. So <coughs> we're we're doing something completely different. Children in the early 1900s didn't eat that much sugar. Now, I know for a fact that uh, my generation, we ate a lot of sugar. Uh, we, we, we have it everywhere. And uh, look what's happening to our population. That's what's <coughs> going to happen to the next generation because they're being exposed to something that in low quantities is good. We need sunlight. We need to have UV light to make vitamin D so we grow. But we don't need that much and that much exposure. Is it something we have to consider? Looking this da data, uh, not only uh, children use uh, iPad. If we think to low vision patient, they use these mm -hmm. devices in order to yeah. do yes. everything, and so and and their retina is compromised, and so we have to think also uh, about this patient, and so we have to understand more and more. 
And do you think that the blue light uh, emitted uh, from the TV is harmful or not? It's, it, it, it's, it's the same. From the TV, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same. It's just that we're farther away, so everything's in radiation. It's, it's how close you are. Uh, a TV, we tend to watch <coughs> it from several feet away. Mm. Uh, I know my children, they, they do this. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know why, <laughs> you know. Um, and they always do it. <laughs> you know, they're not myopic. They just do it. I don't know why, but I, 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 I always gives me a little uh, thing in my stomach <laughs> when they do that, you know, uh, because that's a lot of um, radiation. Yeah, and there's an inverse square inverse for, square, exactly, for radiation, yes. so the closer you bring it, obviously it's a squared rule, so you really are increasing it enormously. Absolutely. Our exposure to uh, indoor blue light is unprecedented in human history. I don't know if it's bad, I don't know if it's good, but Yes, you know, it's yeah. got to be aware of it. Uh, do you think that uh, the, the discomfort on the screens are related to blue light or not? Uh, or we, we can conclude that uh, a lot of uh, factors are involved to, exp to yeah. explain that, not only the blue light. I think a lot of factors are... I think if you're talking about things like agree. digital vision syndrome, then there probably are lots of factors. A lot of factors. Yeah. A lot of factors. Okay. But blue light is po possibly a, a main factor there. I think well, the answer is it's very difficult to know because we're looking at this, we're having more blue light, but we've got a closer working distance, we're staring for longer periods, we're keeping our eyes open, we're blinking less. So the difficulty is teasing out which of those factors are causing the discomfort. Um, and it is probably a combination of factors, but I think it's difficult at the moment to say, well, actually, it's definitely the blue light that's causing the discomfort rather than other changes in the tear film. So I think, um, there is an increasing understanding of what they call computer vision syndrome or various other um, terminology used for it. Um, but trying to tease out which factors are, are causing that is, is probably not um, available from the current literature. Blue light is the main wavelength of uh, glare or that causes glare, at least if you look at a spectrum of wavelengths of light that it causes probably three to four times more glare than other wavelengths of light. Glare in itself is a big problem for a lot of my patients, especially those who've had cataract surgery. Sure. Uh, and that causes some distress um, to them. And that's what I see in my population, especially those with macular degeneration. Um, uh, the glare is much more prominent when they're using these devices than when they weren't. So a lot of them just don't. So we have to consider cumulative <coughs> exposure, yep. sunlight uh, plus uh, digital screens. Mm -hmm. And we know that everyone is concerned by this. And more than 90% in individuals use a computer. Um, and the, the time, we spend more and more time uh, with this. So um, do you think that we have to reduce the exposition for our kids? Or for we have to recommend more protection with uh, reducing the, the time or both? What is your difficult to reduce exposure because so Come much on. of their world is focused right. around it. Um, right. And uh, I use the word screen addicted because um, <laughs> you are our, addicted. Uh, a lot of our youth <laughs> and adults um, are, and, and I'm sure in all of our lives we spend more and more hours in front of the screen, even if it's in surgery and things. Now we have tablets and computer controls. Um, so I think the exposure is not something we're going to change. Um, the things that we can change are either the protection um, or the lighting itself. But again, um, LEDs have so many benefits in terms of uh, an economic way of uh, producing light. I very much doubt that that will change significantly in the um, near future. Do you think really that LED is harmful and for the retina? For the LED, uh, it's clear that there is no regulation and yet it's very difficult to know what type of LED you are buying. Yes. So you don't know whether there's a big peak of uh, blue light in the LED that you will be buying. Yes. Right. So it's very Important. difficult because yes. of these absence of rules, at least in Europe. So, and so the concern was really to raise the question about some population that might be more at risk, like young people or age people, so the, we were really concerned that this absence of any regulation 
could be very harmful for some population at risk. What we see also in this uh, LED illumination is that in fact the turquoise light is much dimmer and in fact turquoise light is also controlling the size of the pupil. Yeah. So pupil constriction is really uh, triggered by uh, this turquoise light and in fact you see that there's really a low, low, lower intensity in the turquoise so in fact pupil contraction might be less and might le and leave uh, the blue i mean more toxic light enter into the eye so there's this balance between blue turquoise light and blue toxic light might be changed also <coughs> okay. and so it might uh, induce more toxic more toxicity to the retina I mean, in our case, I think we have to remember that when we go outside, mm. the blue light intensity is really very high. Very high. And okay. so this is, I think, the greatest uh, blue light that we see in our lives. So we have to remember that whenever we go outside, we have to protect from this blue light. The starting point of this uh, work was that it has been uh, really demonstrated, or at least there are evidence, that uh, sunlight is uh, toxic and can induce edge-related macular degeneration. So sunlight, and especially blue light, the blue spectrum in sunlight. So what we wanted to do is really to try to define which wavelengths are really toxic mm -hmm. in the blue light. Because we have heard that this blue light close to the UV, but there's also the good blue light uh, for circadian rhythm. Yes. So we wanted to know whether we could suppress some of the blue light yes. in the spectrum in order to do some kind of prevention for edge-related macular degeneration. So what we did was to take some uh, a model, a cellular model of edge-related macular degeneration and this model is taking a cell of the retinal pigment epithelium mm -hmm. and loads them with A2E. A2E is a compound that is found in uh, lipofuscin. So uh, this uh, compound is accumulating with H in uh, retinal pigment epithelium. And it's known that this compound can induce some kind of phototoxic damage. But it was only shown with blue light, but it was not clear which wavelengths can induce this type of damage. Mm -hmm. So twa what we did uh, was to take these uh, retinal pigment epithelium loaded with A2E and expose them to 10 nanometer of light mm -hmm. and do this from uh, 390 up to uh, 520 nanometer and also have a control in the blue range at 630 so that we would see which of these wavelengths are toxic for the retinal pigment epithelium. And wha what we can see is that in the range from, uh, so on the, the wavelengths with uh, the central bone at 420, 430, 440, we see, and, <coughs> we, and 450, we see that we can induce apoptosis, so cellular degeneration in these retinal pigment epithelial cells with these wavelengths. So in fact, this means that the band from 415 to 455 is toxic on the retinal pigment epithelium. So on this, edge related, on this model of edge-related macular degeneration. So of course it's a model, but we try to use also light intensities that reach the retina. We can at least know that the more toxic wavelengths on this model are these, uh, the, the ones that we define from 415 to 455. And we have confirmed this result sure. more recently by showing that uh, reactive oxygen species are produced exactly by these wavelengths. So we can show that not only we have toxicity, but we can show also some uh, 
production of these species. We can show also that we have mitochondrial damage on these same model. And we also showed that, in fact, when we uh, do this irradiation, we have also a decrease in um, the defense metabolism, like uh, glutathion, is decreased in these cells. So it really suggests that uh, this uh, light, this blue light, is inducing uh, a lot of reactive species, a decrease in the oxidant defense, and also a mitochondrial defect. So we, we can conclude that we have uh, strong evidence with uh, research on phototoxicity. We know that blue light is the only photooxidative light. I've been studying math generation since I was in seventh grade. And, and we've, we've found out that photooxidation or oxidation is the main player in terms of upregulation of vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, the uh, production of apoptosis and geographic atrophy, right? We know this, right? And we also know that activation of the complement system and inflammation is what really causes math degeneration. What wavelength of light does all those things? Only blue light. Blue light will upregulate complement. It will inactivate uh, the complement inhibitory pathways of the alternative pathway. It also will cause photooxidation and cause an upregulation of oxidative uh, products when it is uh, lipofusin, which is a byproduct that it's a marker for math degeneration, is exposed to blue light. What more evidence do you need? The long-term hazards. This is uh, very uh, difficult to conclude yeah. because of the study that uh, the, de the design of the study are not good. We can't conclude. What what is the conclusion for you? I think this there is, are we have an alarm, some but indications, but um, the studies are not um, yeah, designed for. Yeah. yeah, I think the basic science supports that it is hazardous, mm. but the clinical science, well, that's going to take 20 years to promote protection, you need really strong data. Mm. And um, mm. you have strong data about uh, smoking and lung cancer. You have strong data about smoking and AMD. But to me at the moment, the data about exposure to light or blue light and uh, advanced AMD are, to me, uh, I think not very convincing. So there are two mm. options. Either you, you decide to protect yourself or to, 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 to promote protection because you think that this may be true. Mm -hmm. So it, just in case you, you say that may be true, so I don't want to take the risk of <coughs> exposure, or you wait for strong evidence, but then the strong evidence may arise lately and too late for <coughs> uh, a full generation of people. Yeah. So, so I, I think that that's, that's, that's a big challenge uh, yeah. to me at the moment. What I mean is that there is a gap, not always, mm -hmm. but there is a gap between um, uh, science in the lab and, and, and human real, real, real <coughs> life uh, evidence. And what I would like to see, and I'm one second, one second very open, is, is what I would like to see is a bridge that is really strong enough in between those two things. And what about the, the selective uh, photoprotection with uh, the glasses now, or the IOLs? What do you think about this? The photoselective protection is to, uh, to, to, to block um, the, the beginning of the blue light and to transmit the, the good blue light. The job of a retinal degeneration's doctor is to preserve that, uh, that the cone exactly. photoreceptors. And using blue light protection is actually the, the simplest. Wearing protective eyewear against filtering out blue light, there's no toxicity to that. Uh, I always recommend uh, blue protective lenses. Every one of my patients gets that recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for the last five years. Can we uh, define a population at risk? Definitely. That's, that's why I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, no. Yes. Yeah, I mean. So, the um, children, old people, people with low vision. Yes, of course, people with low vision. I think that both uh, uh, children and uh, older people are at risk. 
children because they have uh, less filter with the crystalline and the lens and the cornea. And uh, on the other end, they have uh, older people because uh, they have less uh, uh, retinal uh, um, mechanism, self mechanism protection. And so, and so we have to consider to protect both children and uh, older people, even if we know that there are not strong evidence as we, as we said before. We may wonder whether the poor protection of the eye in young patient is inducing this high rise of lipofishing in these very young uh, patients. And this lipofishing we know is very toxic. So if we could reduce this amount in these young patients, then we may lower the risk also for long-term effect. Because we see that mm -hmm. between the age of zero There's and two ten, periods, yes. Yeah. Yeah. During the, the repetition uh, is increasing. Just at the time where we have very low protection, we have a big rise. And what's quite interesting is also the rise is when uh, uh, patients are aging, when in fact the protection by uh, macular pigment is also decreasing because there's less absorption of macular pigments. In my experience, I can say that this could be true maybe not for healthy people, but for people who suffer from, in my experience, retinal dystrophy. We know, as uh, Dr. Tolentino said, that the blue light uh, affected the glare. And so in this kind of patient, the fact that uh, we use a, a selective filter for blue light, uh, increase visual acuity, increase contrast sensitivity, and decrease the glare. And so the visual uh, fatigue is less for those kind of, of, of patients. The other things, uh, thing we know is that the uh, protection is uh, costless uh, from a, a safety point of view. So if we use uh, some lenses, we do not uh, do any damage to the, the retina. So we, it's, a, it's a costless solution. So we, we could consider to, 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 to protect the eye from, from blue toxic light. Do you prescribe an antioxidant in order to reduce the progression uh, to AMD uh, uh, for our rights conclusions? What do you think about what what one do you prescribe the antioxidant one <coughs> in Spain very in Spain. early? Um, for years, I was prescribing all the antioxidants in the market and all the doses of omega three. Uh, one. 50 milligrams, no, 500 milligrams per day, and then one gram per day, and after that, 1.5 uh, grams per day. And I have no uh, no significant effect. Uh, a great part of my patients were uh, religiously uh, uh, taking the medicine all the days, three times a day. And at five years, several patients develop uh, macular degeneration and neovascular degeneration. Yeah. Then I stop. The and you stop? I stop the recitation. When you have the exhibition. So you stop for all of them? Yes, for all. Okay. Okay. In France, Jean-François? No, no, I still, I still recommend it. Yes. Um, uh, but I, I, I also recommend, wh when I recommend uh, supplementation to patients with, uh, for example, uh, advanced AMD in one eye and uh, drusen on the fellow yeah, eye. Yeah. Mm. I usually turn around to the to the children of the patient mm -hmm. and I tell them stop smoking and eat mm. appropriate well, food. Well, <laughs> 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 I recommend uh, stop smoking. Yeah. Yeah. Because because uh, because uh, it's probably more important for the, yeah, for the children of the AMD patients that are <coughs> 40, 50 years old to, to, to modify their, do, their behavior. Do you start very early? Uh, no. With small drusen? No, no, I don't stop. I don't start very early. I start when there are either large drusen or advanced AMD in one okay. eye. I think it's okay to prescribe them like it on wet, wet AMD on one, one side eye. and the other. You have big drusen. In the UK, in terms of educating our eye care practitioners of the future, we encourage them to talk to all of their patients about nutrition because it's not just uh, an elderly thing. And as we've said, the benefits may well be much earlier than that. Um, and it is about nutrition, so if they're not eating well, and a lot of patients will admit they're not eating well, then obviously there is the supplementation to, to help them.
in clinical setting that we have every day, the whole people ask us what we can do for to do to don't have those maculopathy. It's not really a, a easy response to give to them because the protection probably the beginning outside. Um, no, the beginning uh, younger. Younger, yeah. Well, um, uh, it is really an insidious uh, problem that we're having. Um, we don't know the hazards of uh, high energy visible light, mainly because uh, we like that kind of light. What I've been uh, studying for the last five years is uh, the notion that uh, high energy visible light is similar to sugar for diabetics. Um, back in the 50s and 40s, we thought that sugar was good for you. And as a result, we placed a lot of high fructose corn syrup into our diets. Now, the common knowledge is such that sugar is bad for you. It causes chronic disease, blindness, heart attacks, strokes. And I believe high energy visible light has all the makings of the sugar of our generation. I think there are a couple of important things here. One, these are relative intensities. Correct. So although we are seeing a peak at 100% on the blue for the LEDs, the amount of light is a lot less sure. than you get from sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, Dr. Tolentino's point about sugar, if you look at, for example, um, Aboriginal populations who have now been exposed to sugar, their rate of diabetes is through the roof. Mm -hmm. So it is actually about our body's ability to deal with uh, the relative ba balance of nutrition, for example, and the balance of light is now changing. So we seem to be putting much more blue into the eyes than other wavelengths. And again, that long-term exposure is something we don't fully understand in terms of its potential for damage. We know sunlight does damage because of its pure intensity. This is a very different concept. So here now we have much lower intensity, but a longer duration and a very different balance across the spectrum. It's a balance. We, we, we do not have to create an alarm on, uh, on blue light, but it's something we, we, need, uh, we need to consider because the evidence uh, on the model are, are very strong. And uh, it's not only a preventive measure, but for some patients uh, are also something uh, that could improve, as said before, the, the, the quality of life. So we, we have to think uh, of, this, uh, um, of these lenses from a <coughs> preventive point of view, but also from a, 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 a way to, to, to increase the quality of life of some affecting patient, like retinal dystrophy, as I said before. I don't prescribe yeah. blue filters yeah. because uh, I think there is no in vivo or in life evidence of, uh, of the use uh, of blue light, blue light blockers uh, is better for my patients. I believe everybody should have some protective wear. We can recommend protection before to have the relevance. Yeah, for, for blue violet. For blue violet, so, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we can yeah. conclude that we yeah. can recommend the, the protection. Right, absolutely. As early as possible. I would. In children? In children and in, 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 in all yeah, people. Definitely in children. After cataract surgery too. After cataract surgery. It's just a... Um, a strategy to prevent a risk that may occur yeah. or to wait sure. to be sure before starting preventing and that's uh, that's a big challenge <laughs> but bo I think that uh, um, there is probably no risk to start preventing yes uh, there may be a risk to delay the prevention so you should stop smoking have a good diet with uh, filters <laughs>what I would like to have and what I see in the future is that we can um, do genetic testing mm -hmm. to identify high risk population mm -hmm. so you just um, let the non-risk population do what they want mm -hmm. but on the high genetic risk population then you put a lot of, of pressure on them to um. prevent with whatever you, you want to prevent the risk because this has been shown by the Rotterdam team if you <coughs> identify your high risk population yes. and you you prevent, you reduce the risk to the normal population. So the genetic risk ah, yes, is not something that you mm. have to consider as, as something very strong and irreversible. If you modify other risks, especially diets, 
the genetic risk goes yeah, down. I think that genetic testing is, is the challenge for the next 10 years. Yes. But uh, on the other end, it's not because you have the uh, bad profile that you will develop the disease. And um, for AMD, there are well-known factors that you can modify, like food sure. and smoking. Correct. And um, I think that promoting protection from blue light is uh, something that we discuss. But, 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 but if there is one thing to do is stop smoking if you smoke, and the other thing to do is to eat appropriate good food uh, with omega-3 and carotenoids, etc. And this is well, well established that if you, if you have a, a, an appropriate normal diet, um, you decrease the risk even if you have the high genetic profile. So um, uh, it's not because you have the genetic okay. profile that you will do the disease for sure. It's, it's, it's complex. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. No, but no, you no. can be aware. The, the genes are just predisposing genes. They're not, they don't say if you have the genes that you will get the disease. Of course. Now, you described two modifiable factors, mm -hmm. smoking and diet. Mm -hmm. The issue is that I have many, many patients, and I'm sure you all have here in, the, in this room, patients who don't smoke and who eat very, very well and still get macular degeneration, yeah. right? <coughs> so we've got to find out more modifiable factors. That's why we're in this room, correct? Correct. <coughs> I think we need to educate doctors, we need to educate patients in terms of you know, what they need and how much they need, right? I think it should be tailor-made.